want to welcome you guys uh, to, to the room. And we also want to thank you guys for welcoming us so uh, openly and freely. And it's been really good. And I was, I was sharing with somebody that uh, we, we've fallen in love uh, a little bit with TT Town, which is uh, everybody's so relaxed and, and laid back and easygoing. And uh, you know the, the, the world that we come from in, in Atlanta is considered laid back con compared to other places in the United States. And, uh, even compared to this, Atlanta seems like it's New York City, so, <laughs> so it's nice, and uh, you guys are all so welcoming, so thank you. Um, uh, we are, um, Christy's going to introduce you to Element a little bit, but um, I, I just wanted to say that uh, we are, we're frequent speakers at film festivals and, um, you know, other, other training events, and a lot of what we do is sort of, I hate to say it's canned, but to a certain extent, you know, people need to hear the same things, but um, I don't know, how many people were at the finance panel yesterday? Yeah, yeah I recognize many of you. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so as we were going through the finance panel, I was listening to the conversation. Early on in the conversation, it was, uh, you know, mostly, you know, us sort of talking about the topics that we had prepared, and then later on, it was a really robust discussion among all of you about the environment here and some of the challenges that you face uh, as, you, as you try to not only, not just use the incentive, but um, you know, make any sort of project and get any sort of financing and just move the needle a little bit. And so we've sort of tailored, we very much tailored what we wanted to talk about today to address some of that. Um, and so I wanted to give you guys a heads up. Um, a after Christy introduces um, you know, who we are, We'd like to just hear from you. Um, so if you could just sort of think about you know, the topics that you're most interested in. The, the, top, the title of this is Tax Incentives and Rebates. That's what this first session is supposed to be. And then after a break, we're, we're going to be talking about financial return, uh, which is really a lot of what we talked about yesterday. Like how do you communicate with the guy that was on the panel and talk to him about value? And um, so we're going to go into some detail on what that looks like and how you guys can educate yourselves. Uh, but this first session, we want to hear from you about what, what you know about the tax incentive and rebate program here, what you know about it globally, and how it works with not only uh, this environment, but in a co-production model. And so you guys be thinking about that, you know, what it is that you, you would really get the most out of talking about. And then, you know, when, I think when we, after we finish introducing, we'd like to hear from you. Yeah? Yeah, sounds good. And um, again, uh, Christy Claybaugh, John Thomas, we are from Atlanta. We have a firm in, in Atlanta, Element, CPA, and I brought, I set over on this table, there's a stack of take home information, a little bit more detailed about our firm and what we do and who we serve, but ultimately Element is a certified public accounting firm. So we, we offer all of the traditional accounting firm services from tax return, preparations, filing, compliance, audits for, for um, all industries from construction to professional services, uh, doctors, lawyers, are all our clients. But what makes our firm a little different is that we have a heavy concentration and focus on the film and entertainment industry. And, uh, the bulk of our clients are uh, above and below the line, production houses, uh, studios, sound stages, uh, all the way to the, um, the wardrobe trucks, the people that own those, um, those types of companies. So, but most often we spend our time helping uh, producers and sometimes the creators who who are looking to not only take advantage of tax incentives in our state and Georgia, but all over the nation and abroad. We have a few clients that are in Bollywood that sometimes will want to come and film in Atlanta, but sometimes they're just not interested in the, despite what the tax credit, the return on investment is going to be for them. So no, they just don't want to film there. And so we'll go to London and, and, and vet out the tax credit there or, um, Hopefully, we'll be bringing them here to vet out the tax credit here, you know. So that's kind of a little bit about what we do. We are a certified public accounting firm, but again, we, we tend to concentrate on the film and entertainment industry from the tax credit audits, production accounting, and the consulting up front 
in the development part before you're even um, on set, you know, maybe when you're working with your investors and helping you to navigate those type of negotiations and the relationships there. Did I leave anything out? It's probably on that flyer over there if I did. Yeah, I mean, I think that's most of the really relevant uh, services that I think we can help talk to you guys about. Um, and then, uh, yeah, well, so let's, let's hear from you guys. I mean, if you, you know, as it relates to the, um, the rebate here, and then maybe even globally, what, what, sort of, um, what sort of questions do you guys have or, or issues do you face with the re I know we have someone from Film TT here, so we'll be super brutally honest about all of the frustrations. And she can sort of speak to that, and we'll speak to what we see, and <coughs> best practices, and those sorts of things. So as it relates to that, what kind of general questions do you guys well, have? Also, who's questions? in the room? Yeah, yeah. Actually, let's start there. Who, who, who do we have in the room? Do we have uh, film producers? Producers. Um, okay, do we have... Um, accountants. Do we have any accountants, yeah. or, or maybe someone interested in what it, a production accounting is? or Because that'll help us tailor our conversation, too. Do we have an accountant? Okay. It's just basically as a producer, you end up all the yeah. Right, so you're line producing, yeah. Yeah, a little compliance. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Um, are there any lawyers? Uh, yep, two lawyers, good. And are you guys entertainment focused attorneys? Um, or are you trying to get into the practice? Is, okay. Do you have any attorney, f I mean, uh, CPA friends or chartered accountant friends that you can bring with you? Um, yeah, that's something, that's something else we can talk about. Um, yeah. yeah, we can we can have yeah. an offline conversation about that. Okay, well, good. Why don't you guys let us know what 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 are the um, relevant topics that we should definitely hit in in this hour segment? We want this to be interactive, not to put you on the spot right now, but feel free. Like as we are going through some of the conversations and some of the information that John and I already have prepared, if you think of something and and we kind of go over it or pass over it, don't don't be shy. We're in a small enough group. I mean, if it weren't for the cameras, we'd throw these things down. We don't even need them. We could sit and we can have more of a one-on-one. -on -one. I like it. Uh, this is a good, intimate size group. Yeah. So tell us what you have. Yep. Uh, Co-productions and yes. incentives in other territories and how that comes together. Yes. Yep. Incentives from two different countries. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, what's the structure of proposal for potential investor? OK, so tell me more. Uh, is this? Structuring the company for investment, um, using their money, and, and how it plays that with that as well. No, but um, specifically, you know, having a potential investor, and they're asking for you know a proposal in terms of return on investment, or yes. how you would how would you how you would value the IP and things like that. Uh -huh. So bringing something to the table to negotiate. That's perfect, and that's we're actually going to spend a lot of time on that in our second segment. Starting at 3.30, that's really the, the, a big, heavy focus there. So we'll go into some depth. Yeah, keep drinking up, yes. I may need some by then, too. Did you happen to, uh, were you able to participate in the, the legal panel earlier with Thomas? Yeah, I heard that went very well. Good, good. What else? So how they work in general? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect, yeah. I think that's probably where we should start with the different types of incentives. Mm -hmm. What else? Same with rebates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. In terms of the process. I mean, obviously, it'd be different in different countries. Mm -hmm. Yep. <coughs> okay. Anything else specifically? Yep. Uh, also, um, where there are financing rebates and incentives with opportunities to get. Uh, money finance based on uh, uh, securing a rebate or securing a tax credit. Mm -hmm. How do we you know, start a conversation or do we start a conversation to find the money that comes back from our rebate? Yep. And how do you get the money back from, from the distribution side? Because that's, that's the whole thing. Once you sign that distribution deal, the money needs to now flow back to all the various investors. And, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, we can definitely get into some structural uh, conversation, I think, probably, probably in the second segment. Okay, what else? Who's giving the money? 
Where does it come from? That's a good question. Where, where are they? Where does it come from? <laughs> yeah. Right. Where is this? Where does the money come from? You know, need the money. We a, a big part of what we're going to be talking about with, in the incentive conversation is co-production. You said this yeah. is. Um, we actually are going to be presenting a case study to you guys, um, and talking about a successful co-production model that worked in the state of Georgia early on in their credit program and what they did to get started. And I think it'll hit. It'll hit on some of that. Um, just because it was in Georgia doesn't mean it can't apply here, because the the tax uh, incentive that's here is, is is similar to many in the states, including Georgia. And the mechanics of it can be, um, you can use that as a resource to help you, especially in a co-production situation, in that type of scenario. Okay, good. You want to jump into types? Oh. And we'll, uh, so why don't we jump into types, and then we can go into um, yeah. Uh, the uh, the rebate model and the co-production, and I think I think that's. And at some point, I think you can pop up yeah. here. Okay. Yeah. Um, just from a higher level, tax incentives can vary in the different forms that um, they exist in different states and different countries. Tax incentives can be presented in the form of a tax credit, a tax uh, cash rebate. Um, the income tax credits are often they're either transferable or refundable and sometimes there are grants and so what makes the difference between these forms of tax incentives is when the money comes how does it come um, and can you sell it um, a, a grant will generally come from uh, the organization, a governmental organization, and it comes before you shoot. A tax cash rebate is going to come um, as a check after you've shot. And this is assuming you've met all the qualifications to qualify for this rebate or the tax credit or the grant. So this is assuming you've done all your due diligence and now it's time to cash in on the rebate or, or the incentive. Um, with tax credits, when you hear uh, a program that's a tax credit, that means that it's a credit against your income tax liability there in that jurisdiction. Sometimes those tax credits um, are transferable, which means you can sell it to another taxpayer. That's the type of tax incentive that we have in Georgia, and it's made it very lucrative because um, I come in, say I fly in from Trinidad to Atlanta and I shoot a film and I'm going to, after all said and done, I have $50,000 of tax credit, but I have no income tax liability in Georgia. I have no income in Georgia. I've just had to spend here. But John is a taxpayer in Georgia and he has a tax liability of $50,000 to keep math simple. Um, so I'm going to sell this credit to John. I can't sell it to him um, at full face value because, I mean, he'd get no benefit. He could just pay his tax liability to the state and be done. But where there's a market that's created and what makes it a great opportunity is, um, right now we're seeing fair market value anywhere from 89 cents to 92 cents on the dollar. So let's just say I, I, he, he pays me 40, gr 40 grand, he gets a $50,000 voucher to turn in and settle his $50,000 tax liability. Actually, the savings could be more, but you see where I'm going. He's just saved 10,000 and I've just walked away with 40, 40 grand cash to invest in my next film. So that's transferable tax credit. A lot of states are not, just because you see tax credit, um, film credit, doesn't mean that you can transfer it. The it's not a non it's non transferable which means you're going to refund get a refund keep in mind you can only transfer that credit one time so once i've sold it to john it's done the other type was um oh non transferable it's just a refundable credit against against your tax liability so grants rebates credits refundable and transferable at a higher level those are the different forms and what we have in trinidad is a, a rebate Cash yeah, so your local tax credit is uh, your local tax incentive is a rebate, and uh, in in a lot of ways that is so much better than a credit against tax liability because you're only dealing with two participants in the transaction. 
uh, the producer and the government who is providing the rebate. And so uh, because of that, well, two, two things. One, uh, there are fewer market participants. But uh, two, um, because there's no market transaction, there's no um, natural development of due diligence processes that happen around the tax credit. And so for, for the attorneys in the room, you know, one thing we see in credit environments is uh, a stringent, in a, in a rebate environment rather, uh, is, a, is a lack of a stringent um, rebate due diligence process. Um, and we actually had a conversation about this earlier where there's a lot of conversation about strengthening the due diligence process and make it really um, understandable to producers to know what you have to do during the credit process to develop your books and records. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit more in our case study. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, but, but in a credit environment, if you ever end up in a credit environment where you're transferring credit from one place, from one taxpayer to another taxpayer, um, there's generally market participants. And out of that grows this natural due diligence that a buyer demands that you do before they'll buy it. And so, um, you know, in, in this case, I think some of the lack of understanding about the process has to do with the fact that everybody wants checklists. People want things to be orderly and natural. And that's what accountants want. We want them to be orderly and natural. Um, sometimes attorneys have to take nebulous situations and interpret them into things that someone else can understand. And so, um, uh, so in, in our line of work, we uh, sort of specialize in doing both of those things. And so in this case study that we're going to present to you, um, we're going to hit on those things. Do you want to introduce who Tom is? <clears throat> Tom Hamilton? Yeah. Tom Hamilton is a client of ours at our firm that um, he has been in the film and entertainment industry long before in Atlanta, long before we had the lucrative tax film tax credit. I don't know if you people are from, familiar with the Atlanta film industry, and, and it's just booming right now because they they took an incentive that was kind of around for a long time, and they did one thing. They one big thing is they made it transferable and they rewrote the code and, and tweaked it, but transfer the transferability became around. But bef then we had an influx of people come in. But before that, there were still people that have been around for years and years with studios and production houses. And Tom has a production house, trip, um, uh, Spitfire Studios, and he has really um, turned out and, and, and he was kind of like he was so brilliant in the way that we were able to work with him to put together a model so that he could get the most of the credit um, using co-production, right? Co right? The co-production model. Um, and he's worked on everything. For, he does full feature films, commercials, some shorts, some docs. Um, I'm not sure much about TV shows, but no, for the most part, TV, full but, feature. Um, like you said, before the, before the tax incentive came around, he was, you know, we have uh, TBS is and CNN, and, and these are the big television companies in Atlanta that really were the only entertainment participants before the tax credit. And so what happens is in those big environments, producers will start out, they'll cut their teeth a little bit, they'll learn the business, and they'll make a decision. They either have to leave and go to LA, um, which is uh, what a lot of people do in, in places even like this, that. You know, you really want to be involved in the industry. You have this desire to make films and uh, television shows. And so you decide to leave to where they do these things and there's more opportunity. Uh, well, the other option is you do what Tom did and you stay. And uh, so what Tom did is he developed uh, contracts with certain people to make certain content, stayed in Georgia even before the tax incentive, and he just got the business that he could. Mm -hmm. And I picture that period of time in Georgia as being very similar to where you are here now, uh, where there is, um, there's work to be done. Um, you know, you guys are making projects. You have a lot of original content that you dream of creating. But there's also some other work that you can do for other people. And you know, you're sort of sprinkling that in where you can. And I see a couple of head nods, so I think maybe that's you know, maybe true. Um, uh, and you know, so as, as time goes, um, you know, Tom, uh, de decided to make his money in commercials because that's that's where the money was, um, and so he would make you know ten or twelve commercials a year for big brands uh, who wanted to advertise on the big television networks mm -hmm. um, that were in Atlanta, and that's how he got his 
um, connections. And so he built out, because people were bringing this money in out of state uh, to do commercial shoots, he, he earned money to buy things like cameras and cabling and a truck and built out his suite in his business. And um, that allowed him at some point to take a deep breath and start to think about what else he could do. He's putting food on the table. He stayed in Georgia, so he was really happy about that. He didn't have to leave home. But at some point, you know, the yearning inside between him and his business partner to do something different than to sell soap or cars, uh, it welled up, as, <laughs> as all of you know. Um, your dream is to make your content. And while he's making other people's content, he's thinking about the content that he wants to make. Um, and so something amazing happened. Uh, the government brought a tax incentive. And so he thought, great, it's going to be amazing. Everybody's going to want to shoot. It's going gonna, it's gonna to just change the entire landscape. But it didn't. It didn't. Mm -hmm. And it didn't for him um, until he started to do um, something to change that. Um, Tom had a business partner named Tripp, and Tripp had a dream to make two movies. Um, and these movies were scripts that he wrote. Um, he carried around his back pocket for a long time, and um, he shopped them around to places and couldn't get anybody to bite. Um, and ultimately, um, he sat on it and made commercials with Tom. And when the tax incentive came around, he understood that now he was leveraging down his cost to produce by using the tax incentive. And he was a very smart uh, entrepreneur. Um, and so uh, what, what he did is he took that rebate um, and took it out on the road and tried to shop it again. Has is, is anybody in the room took the rebate and tried to shop, it to some, shop an idea to somebody? Yeah, we're doing a little bit of that, yep. And what, what has the response been when you've done that? Tell, tell me what was good. Yeah. Which is good for me. And then there were those who had heard about it and had used it considerably. Yeah. So it was not beneficial to them. You know, so but but at the end of the day it, it's a lot of people work. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you try to explain it like we would call it a meal, just as sometimes with regard to the explaining, you know, yeah. the technical side of it or even Nika. Um, but at the end of the day some people just don't want to get involved. Right. Despite the fact that you know you're getting a rebate. And you're talking about financiers. Yeah. yeah, so that's exactly what happened to Tripp. So Tripp went out on the road and he tried to sell this thing. And uh, he said, no, look, I mean, the cost of this thing is 70 cents on the dollar. It's going to be fantastic, but we're still getting 100% quality movie. And people said, uh, how much money will I make, right? So <laughs> which is what everybody asks. And so um, ultimately, that was sort of a, a, a non-starter. You know, it, did, it, it didn't really work. So what he realized was that he's going to have to make his own projects with his own money to prove his concept, um, which is uh, difficult if you don't have any money. Um, and, uh, but what Tom and Tripp were able to do was leverage this work that they were already doing um, to For the commercials. on the commercials to pitch an idea abroad about infrastructure. So one thing that's, that sometimes these um, uh, investors do understand is proven results. So have you guys um, pretty much focused on selling your projects to investors? Or has anybody investigated co-production? Have you had conversations about co-production with people outside of the country? Yeah. OK. So really only a couple of people. OK. Um, so Simran was a movie that came from Bollywood. Do you want to talk about Simran and, and how that came about with Tom and Tripp? I'm not sure which part you want me to talk about. There's well, a lot I mean, to do with Simran. Yeah. Well, why don't we start with, um, you know, Simran came to Georgia, or Fortune Films came to Georgia when we made the introduction, and, and Tom and Tripp had a, um, uh, had a service they could provide. Yeah. So this was a, a Bollywood film that, ca that came to Atlanta and set up shop, and there were a lot of things that just didn't go well in the very beginning. Um, uh, who was it that the guy that didn't pan out in the beginning? Uh, what, what was his role? What was he? Was yeah, he, he was the line producer? He was line producer. Had a line producer that come over. He did not pan out. Like he was not what he said he was. What he presented himself to be. He was a mess. Um, 
you know, the investors, the director, everyone that has money in this film and, is, and, and our stakeholders in this project are still in India. So they have this line producer here running crazy, running amok, just wasting money, not getting things done. John and I are really the only link at this point between uh, the guys in India and the project here is trying to get off the ground. Um, find them a new line producer, try to uh, make some some things go go back well that had really gone wrong and they haven't even begun to shoot yet so we get to the point of shooting and the the money the money there was a lot of money that was already gone that wasn't even budgeted for so we said you know let's let's introduce you just got an idea we gave tom a call said tom I think these guys really could use your help and uh, you know let's set up a meeting let's have a conversation can you be the fixer can you show them you know we need everything it's basically like you know they need uh, location scout they need permits they need uh, we've we've handled the pre cert the tax incentive paperwork that type of thing if we can come to some sort of agreement and maybe talk about a co-production relationship here it's really the last chance that these guys at Cimarron had because they were about to just blow it like it wasn't their fault this was one bad you know line producer that just you know the, this was this was a relationship that I think this is the only reason I think the movie got made. Wouldn't you agree? It was oh, because yeah. of this relationship. And it, so we brought them to Tom, and um, it, they they had. I, I think this was probably the first time that they had met. A, any of them had done a co-production relationship like this in the states. Now, yeah. So the producers, yeah. And there was a cultural difference in doing business. Number one, right off the you know from the start. Uh, you have one one group of people that it's just like okay handshake you know in the United States it's like you sign 15 contracts and deal memos and financing agreements now let's move forward but we have our guys in Bollywood that's just like yeah it'll get done it's gonna be fine let's do it and so and and it did it got done and it, and they that was fine but it's just two different ways of cultures of doing yep. business um, and that say one's right, one's wrong, but we had to get over that hurdle too. So we brought it to Tom. Mm -hmm. You want to finish like, sure, with the yeah. drum roll? Uh, yeah. So we brought <laughs> we we brought it to Tom, and um, Tom said, uh, at, "Everybody's really excited when the new opportunity shows up, right? Everybody, you know, when you're first when you're first in a room and somebody's got a great idea that might work, everybody gets really excited. But at some point." You have to sit down and you have to map out what it's going to actually take to get it done. And that's when people start to get a lump in their stomach a little bit and they're not quite sure, right? So Tom was really comfortable with the co-production model. He had done it a couple of times with commercial shoots. And this was his ticket to reaching the next level and doing something different, making his own content. So this wasn't his content. This was, does anybody in the room know who Cogna Renat is? Cogna or not, she's a Bollywood actress. She's a yeah. um, so she she's she's a, a, a very well known Bollywood actress. She wields some enormous clout in that market, but outside of the market, see nobody in the room knew who she was here. Nobody in Georgia had any idea who she was. She might as well have been, you know, my sister. It doesn't no and, and so she comes here and it's very it's an she's anonymous. These producers are anonymous, right? And so when they're sitting down with Tom. Tom's not impressed by you, <laughs> right? Tom's looking for money. Um, and there's lessons there. We'll talk about that when we, we'll have a little checklist about co-production lessons. But the lesson there for, uh, for him in that moment was, um, uh, you know, egos don't rule the day when you do a co-production model. Profit does, right? And so when we got to that point where we had this list of things that needed to be done, um, everybody got a little bit nervous because on the one hand, it takes money to co-produce for someone. So if you guys were going to produce your own, your own show, um, you might not take any money from it, right? If, you're, if it's your content, you're generating your own value. So if you have a $15,000 budget or a $15 million budget, maybe you take $0 out of either of those budgets because your goal is to own the IP. You're not work for hire. You're creating an asset that has value for you that you can sell to distribute later, right? You're creating, you know, your your business asset. Um, but if you're doing a co-production for someone else, you need to take a fee, 
because that's how you're going to make your money because you aren't going to own anything generally. That was Tom. In this scenario, that would be Tom. Right. So Tom owns nothing. Um, all he could, all he does, he owns cameras, cabling, and trucks that he's generated from this work that he's done as a as a commercial producer over time. Right? And they're going to come in and, and use these this mm -hmm. equipment. And so we, we had to sit down with Tom separately as he got over the shock of cultural differences. <laughs> and um, he wasn't sure uh, that he felt comfortable with the contracts. And would, would, would you guys say that, that contract law is very stringent in Trinidad and Tobago? Or is it, is it, is it closer to Mumbai? Or is it closer to New York City? Well, I mean, in terms of system of laws, our, our, um our system of laws is quite similar to the Indian system in terms of the constitutional law. Yeah. But it functions different because in, in they have different uh, municipalities and different states. So each right. of those individual states actually have different laws as well. Yeah. So on a state level, I can't say, but on a, on a federal level, Indian, Indian laws are very similar to that. British. Yeah. I also want to say that there's a bit of... Right now, we have an aversion, uh, we have observed. The whole thing about, yeah, we'll get to it. Yeah. Uh, because there's a lot of goodwill in the industry, and it's yes. a small industry, uh, people feel averse to, to contracts. Uh, they're slowly moving away from that, we hope it, right. you know, that will change. So that's exactly where I was going with this. I'm oh, sorry. There's also yeah. a lack of specificity in the contracts. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they tend to, yeah, they try to, to <laughs> conflate. I've seen one the other day that, that really and truly has just got off of, but it, it's, it's like half option, half something, half something else. Uh, that is, so this, this co-production uh, was a, a two point, I think I remember it was a 2.5 or 2.8 million dollar below the line production because the above the line costs were producer costs, <coughs> mostly India, and then post came later. So that was just the spend within the market. And Tom is sitting at the table with the same kind of contracts that you're talking about because Shalash, the executive producer, is used to going to somebody in Mumbai and shaking their hand and they have a deal. And that deal is really, um, it's secured by their reputation in the marketplace. But Shalash has no, uh, uh, has, has no um, uh, uh, history, here. Um, has, has uh, no basis for any um, sort of reputation in Georgia, uh, or Trinidad for that matter, or anywhere else outside of Mumbai. Um, and so w as Tom looks across the table and they're reading the, and I would call this, would you, do you remember that first document that, that, that we reviewed? It was, what, two paragraphs? <coughs> it was nothing. <laughs> it, it, barely, it barely made reference to cost and, and had, I think, maybe two dollar signs in it. <laughs> yeah. The whole <laughs> maybe had two dollars on it. Yeah, that's right. You're dealing with yeah. you're dealing with two parties here that have a lot at stake. And there's a lot um, at the end of the day that's going to be paid out, and so it's important to have this documented and not be left out. Um, and so to not spend too much time talking about the cultural differences, but we really had to spend a lot of time to too. meet, yeah, just to meet in the middle and get, well, and it's important too, because you know, you, if you guys are looking into co-production opportunities, which John and I had a really long conversation about these last two days because we were preparing for this panel, um, and that we think this is the, the, the best way to go about bring in you know, other content here is, is the co-production opportunities. But you have to be able to, to be willing to meet and compromise because you, it's co. Co means share. Co means uh, two. You know, you're coming together and you're going for one incentive, one project. So you have to put it all on the table. And, um, one person is not, may not, you know, it's not, one, one party may not get the IP at the end of the project. There's definitely going to be money coming down just from the tax in it alone. So you have to hammer everything out at front. So that's what we tried to do. So we sat at the table and we had this two paragraphs on a piece of paper. <laughs> and Tom, Tom looked at the document and uh, he was ready to walk out of the room. Because if, you know, if you're in the United States and you're doing a $2.5 million agreement uh, where all of his money is going to come out of that budget, and it doesn't really make reference to exactly how much money that is. Um, you know, nobody, nobody's uh, signing anything in the United States. We're used to, you know, when, 
when, when anything happens. Uh, we buy a car, and I'm, I'm sure it's similar here. You buy a car, and there are 18 contracts that you have to sign. But here we are doing this deal that somebody's going to own intellectual property uh, that's going to be distributed in India on a massive scale, and we have two paragraphs on a piece of paper. So uh, Tom said no. <laughs> they weren't even here from, the directors and producers weren't here from India yet. At this point, we're all communicating on Skype. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So the body language, the, the physical presence, like, you know, that type of, that was missing, which is important to have. But these are the type of things that you guys are going to probably look at doing, too, when you're co-producing. You know, you're going to be getting people from abroad to come here. Um, so we did bridge the gap. And uh, the solution to that was both sides had to be educated. So we sat with Tom and we said, you know, we know Shilash well. We know these Indian producers well. We know how they do business because we've had to agree to contracts with them as well. <laughs> so we said, Tom, listen, it's not going to work the way you want it to work. If you want to participate as a co-producer and bring this money here and get this business, and, and by the way, Tom had nothing to do for three months. So he's got an empty, yeah, he's he got an empty shop, right? So he can take it or leave it. It's not like he needs it to, to pay the rent. But you know he could take it or leave it, but maybe take it might be better if you've got nothing going on for three months, right? So uh, we said, Tom, I think it's worth getting over your assumption that they're trying to rip you off. So one of the things you might run into as you do business abroad and you try to bring people here is this, if they look at your um, natural uh, sort of um, vernacular system of contract law, which is not necessarily the governmental system, but it's just how you've agreed to do business with one, with one another. If you aren't prepared to sort of speak their language and do what it takes to hire an attorney and get to the point where you have enough agreements that they feel comfortable, then that's, that could be a non-starter for you. So we, we told Tom, wait, they're not trying to rip you off, but we went to Shalesh and we said, listen, let's make this a little bit easier for them, okay? Let's come up with some contracts that might, might work for him. Let's redline this thing out, and let's just invest in the attorneys. Um, and, and that was the big lesson there. We, we did get a, an attorney involved, and we put a co-production agreement in place. Mm -hmm. Now, a co-production agreement is an agreement that lays out roles and responsibilities for uh, you as a co-producer and the visiting production folks and entities that are going to be investing money here. It's very clear. Uh, who is going to be doing what sort of thing and who is going to own what afterwards. And usually from the co-producer side, it should match how you're marketing yourself as a co-producer. Mm -hmm. Because remember, we're talking about how you can change the way you, you show your services to the world to show that you're not just content creators, but you're someone who can help someone make something in Trinidad and Tobago, which will also later help you to make your content, right? Um, one of the things we talked about yesterday a lot was relationships. And a co-production situation can develop great relationships where somebody can make more than one project with you. And sometimes, oftentimes, when you do something for another person, they want to do something back with you. Um, so in this case, um, Tom and Shabash had to come to terms with what their long-term relationship would look like um, if there was one. And there's lots of promises on the Indian side to say, we're doing this the first time, so give me a discount. Because later I'm going to come back again, right? And then on the American side, it was, I'm not giving you any discount. This is what it cost. In America, what's on the label is what the price is. Uh, so this co-production situation, and, and by the way, in India, nothing cost anything until it cost what you agree to pay at the end, after all the work is done. So handshakes happen. People do work. And they think that maybe it's going to be for this, and they're pretty sure it's going to be for this. But both of them really understand that after the work's done, there's a post-work negotiation that happens. And that's actually the final price that moves. right? And so in this whole scenario, Tom is having to think, that sounds like being ripped off to Tom. <laughs> right? and, uh, but to Shalesh, it sounds like the way that they do business. It's just normal. right? It's, it's very normal. Um, and so a co-production agreement across borders takes all the am ambiguity out of that. Because you can say, look, I know you do business this way. You put it on the table at the beginning. You do business this way. We do business this way. Here's, here's how we need to do business together. And so lesson one with Tom and Shalash is 
be very, very secure that you have a co-production agreement that says, here's what we're going to do for you when you come in the country. Here's what you get, and here's what I get. Right? Um, uh, so is anybody in the room a producer that has sort of collected equipment over time? Do you have, do you have stuff that you've been buying for your, for your productions that you could leverage um, to help other people? Yeah. Um, do you market that? Not yet. OK. That was, um, that was actually in the next short term, short term plan. So hopefully 2020, I would start doing some of it. Not, not really plenty, you know, brune and yeah. um, sliders. And kind of you got some but, stuff, yeah. yeah. So, if you, if you, uh, so it sounds like you thought about maybe packaging that up and, and some sort of model and just market yourself as a as, production as, as, services? As another service, because sometimes that's it. Long day, while I'm editing, that could be open. Right. And if you in somebody's hands, you know, generating some kind of income. Right. Uh, have you, um, and, and so, so if you think about that, you know, if you were going to build your website today, what would you put on the website and say you do as a co producer? What, what you have? You know, what would be your, so what was your name? Warren. Warren? Yeah. Yeah, okay, nice to meet you. Um, um, what, what would Warren co production look like on that? Here's well, what we do. Well, I don't know, they have, they have plenty of things, there's sound design and that kind of stuff too. Would, would, would that be in there, or, or is it just mostly? Um, uh, well, yeah, I guess so that would be a service as well that I might be able to offer to them. Um, cinematography, yeah, basically any, anything that they that, that they need in that um, in that sphere. My sister does marketing and mm -hmm. that kind of thing, so we have plenty. Yeah, that we could um, offer to them, I guess. Is there anybody that does something in this room that he didn't mention? That that, that is your specialty? Does anybody have something that they do for people? Um, what do you do? Animation. Animation. Yeah. So 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 here's here's where I'm going with this. You have a whole community of production um, uh, specialization and uh, expertise. And what Tom did is Tom said, as he got through this process, what can I do for Shellish? So he had to figure out where he's going to make his money. Um, does anybody in the room have experience with developing budgets um, for production? Yep. Do you always budget your productions? No. Okay. Yeah, did you raise your hand? We do a fair amount of commercials, so yeah, yep. we're always working on budgets, always. Yeah, OK. So when you do commercials, you you have a responsibility to report the budget to the person that's paying you to do it, and you give them cost reports and things like that. It's mm -hmm. always changing as, yeah. as we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, so you know, when you are a co-producer, and you're trying to get somebody to come from out of the country, one of the things they don't understand is not just inside of your specialty, but in the entire specialty of the TNT film community, how can you tie in what everybody else does to help you sell yourself as a fixer, as a co-producer, someone who can um, do the entire thing for them, to be their you know, person that's going to handle all of their business? Um, so here's an example. It, Atlanta is a, um, is a heavy union town. Um, do you want to go to any unions? You, you dealt with this a lot at the very beginning. I was just going to kind of interject a little bit oh, yeah. earlier that, um, and this is where John was going, when you have a co-production opportunity, another takeaway is, and John was kind of alluding to this, is how, because we're, we're given this case study because we think that it definitely relates to you guys here and those interested in doing co-productions to help get the most from the tax incentive in Trinidad. Um, how each each party needs something from the other and you have something to offer that the other party doesn't have so like John says and you know what can you do can you do budgets do you have equipment do you have a studio here do you have uh, production accounting do you, have, do you ha you're the fixer here for the other party that you're bringing and in the Tom and um, Shalesh scenario in India the unions are non-existent it's kind of fair to say in the states they're everywhere you have teamsters over transportation you have SAG after over the actresses you have to have there are all these rules and regulations and if you, you know you have to put depending on what your budget is is how much you have to pay the union and if you go over your budget then you owe them more money and if you don't do all the steps they can hold your money and not give you your money back um, here 
the the unions are pretty not existent either, right? So this is a yeah, right? So yes. yet, <laughs> yet, <laughs> but we are saying th we say that to say. Um, in these co-production opportunities or as you're out there having conversations with other production companies and we'll say like in the states or uh, somewhere else that does have unions that's a selling point this is a fix you're the fixer here you have one more thing to another reason for them to come here that that's a lot out of their budget it's a big line item out of their budget in the states that they're not going to have here um, in the John and Chalesh scenario, uh, not John Tom scenario, it was the opposite. So in India, you know, they didn't have to deal with that. They come here or they came there, and they're like, "What? Is, what are you talking about?" They, the, the, the unions come out and said, "You don't have a, you're doing stunts. You don't have a paramedic on on the set. Where's your paramedic? You know, where's your ambulance guy?" No, what are you talking about? We, we do our own stunts and we have band-aids. You know, we're good. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. So I mean, you have to. It's you have to be able. And this is kind of is that what you're getting at with the unions? You have to be able to have those conversations when you're talking about co-productions up front, um, and and be able to present yourself as the fixer. You know, what's in it for them that you can you can give them to get them to come here. Because you know, doing all of this, that's the, the the guys out in India. They needed a place to shoot. They needed someone to help them with their budgets and get things together. They needed to come in and rent Tom's equipment. Um, Tom needed those rental fees. Tom needed those management fees. Tom needed to do something for three months when he wasn't shooting his commercials. And most importantly, what Tom got out of it was he was able to use this as a diving uh, uh, uh what do you call it a jump board a springboard, <laughs> a springboard. <laughs> to I'm, I'm really bad at words like that i just can't get it um but he needed this as a springboard to to be able to to use this as his first big co-production to get him and trip one piece closer to producing their own content finally and this was like a this was a stepping stone so ultimately at the end of the project they both were able to take away what they needed after a lot of work and renegotiations, but it worked. So the payment in terms of was, was production expenses, rental of the equipment, and those different kind of things. I guess it would be low, low Yep, yep. So uh, as so get, getting into the budget. So uh, yeah. So what Tom had to do was look at the budget and find where he could find value. So in in our example with you. Um, when you look at your expertise and you say, here, here is where I can provide expertise, what they're going to be looking for is, I need you to do all of it. So Tom's personal skill set wasn't necessarily all of these areas of a budget that they needed help with. Tom's skill set was some of those areas of the budget. Um, so Tom had to fill in the rest. And what he, what he did is he went out in the community and he said, you know, what do you do? What do you do that you can help? You do sound. Um, you know, you do, uh, you're, a, you're a great grip and electric uh, company. Let's get you involved. And he would build this package out. Mm -hmm. And when he was able to look at this whole thing and build this package out, he was able to present a total solution uh, to these folks to get, to get the thing made. Um, one of the hurdles that he would always have is, if you take something out of the budget and you provide the service, you keep all the profit. But if you take something out of the budget and you give it to someone else, they get the profit, mm -hmm. right? So in a co-production model, um, the tax credit is a massive, massive negotiating point, right? Uh, the only way that somebody is coming in, and, and this is where we get to the nuts and bolts of what you do, if you've decided you can, you can provide all these services, um, you can be the fixer. Somebody can come into the country and you can be a cultural translator for them. You can help them through the contract situation. Um, you can get them involved in the right people. Uh, once, once a union does present itself, you understand the extent of power of that union. You can help them with contracts with the union and making sure that everybody's settled there, nobody gets in trouble. Mm -hmm. Then it's time to figure out who can make what money. Uh, where sometimes um, 
they don't want to pay you a production fee to be a co-producer, they may be able to share the tax credit in order for you to make a little bit more money. And the budget, it isn't final until you factored in the taxes. That's right. Um, and and we're, gonna, we're definitely going to get into you know, what that tax credit does to increase your ROI. Um, but uh, ultimately, this rebate program that you have here, and, so, and please correct me as, as I miss details, but this incentive program is designed to greater incentivize local producers uh, or producers who are partnering with um, foreign entities than it is just foreign entities coming in and doing things by themselves. Yes. So um, the goal is right. to encourage people to come and invest money here and get that money into your pockets. So when you present yourself as a co-producer, one of the big things you can do is say, if you do this yourself, here's your credit. If you do it with me, here's your credit. And for that difference, I want it. But for that difference, here's all the value you're getting from that. Right. So it's almost like the Trinidadian uh, um, government is subsidizing the, yeah. the producer that's coming mm -hmm. from out of the country to hire you and use your services. Because if they were to come by themselves without you, they're limited to 12.5% for the rebate, an international. Um, and then with you, that same spend is a flat 35%. So it's a flat 35 percent yeah. for local producers. For local producers. Yes. But in any case, when a producer is coming into the country, once they're accessing the rebate, they actually ha are compelled, as part of the criteria, to use local producers. That's right. So to the point that John was making, yes, the incentive does um, encourage, in, 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 to me, in, in, at every, no matter how you look at it, you, it is uh, to encourage and, and to incentivize more local producers to leverage it. Yeah. Oh. It's an investment piece too. Yeah. It's a Absolutely. speaking point for investors. When, when I spoke to, to local uh, producers about using the incentive, the way I told them was that essentially what you're allowed to do is to go overseas to develop a co-production deal and say, you know what, I have up to whatever it ends up being, like, like two or three million dollars US worth yep. of with of incentive if you come and you do and you produce anything and, and try not to be good. Mm -hmm. Right? And and that's how that's how that's been able to to work a little bit. But we've not been able to get that. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of that is in, in, in our in our case study, um, a lot of that is uh, sales and marketing. So right. um, I'll tell you that you know we're we're certified public accountants. And uh, we're a little bit unique as CPAs because Chris and I have had backgrounds that weren't just in finance. You know, we've done other things. But oftentimes, CPAs come out of school. Uh, they go and they start to crunch numbers on a computer. And that's all they do. And then when the time comes and they've developed their skill set and they know how to do work for other people, they don't know how to tell them that they know how to do that work. They don't know how to go out and connect with a potential um, client and say, here's why the work I'm doing would benefit you and me. And here's what I'm doing it for. They just know how to say, I do one, two, three, four, five. Choose which ones you like and I'd love to do them for you. As a co-producer, um, you know, especially someone who creates content, you're artists and you're, you're storytellers. And so storytellers oftentimes have a difficult time of uh, doing the one, two, three, four, five, right? So, you know, it's almost like the combination of these two things is what people from out of the country need to see. They need to see you tell a story, but they also need you to say, here's, here's how it's going to work, and here are the steps, and here's who's going to get what. And so, um, ultimately, um, in a co-production model, when you're looking at the tax credit, that delta between what, you know, what, what maybe they would get if they didn't use you and what they would get if they do use you is your fee. You know, that is your value, the additional money uh, that, that they can get to compensate you, even if that's not the full compensation for what you do, it's a part of that compensation. So the way that that was packaged by Tom was Tom presented a budget. And he presented a budget uh, if the movie was made uh, without Tom and a budget with if the movie was made with Tom. 
and he presented this delta to them. And he said, Here, here's the value I provide. But not only did he show the value of the credit split, but he showed the value of Tom providing those individual services inside the budget and him coordinating the things that, uh, that he didn't provide in the budget. And what Tom was able to provide was this total solution where he said, I see, I know how much money I need to make to co-produce this thing for you coming in from out of the country. And I know what you need to get in terms of finishing it within a budget. And here's how we're going to get there with credit and with these items in the budget that I'm going to provide. And when he was able to provide that delta between with Tom and without Tom, mm -hmm. uh, they could see the value and it made sense to them. Um, ultimately, what happened after the project was uh, shot is that it went over budget. But it went over budget because they wanted a techno crane. And they wanted, you know, they uh, ultimately sometimes producers just spend money. Um, but what was great about that is. There was money is, wasted in, on the very front end, too, though, with that's Mark. A, that's a lot of money wasted on the front end. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, it, and it ran the risk of, and, and I don't know, maybe you guys are already kind of piecing this part of the story together, but what happened was um, when it went over the budget, Shellesh wanted to say, we need to share in the responsibility of it going over budget. Because mm -hmm. it's a co. Co, right? It's co, which um, there was some pushback on Tom's side because, you know, he's just, right. he's going to go back to that contract, remember? The contract that if it's constructed and, and um, written in the right way, it's a good document, it should have a paragraph in there that talks about what happens when you go over budget. Whose part does that come out of? That's why those contracts are important. I don't remember. I think ultimately they ended up taking it out of the tax incentive, didn't they? The, uh, the, well, the tax you, incentive when paid. it came back. Tom, Tom got, got paid, paid. Because the contract said what the rate was. Tom was the uh, produ produ yeah. producer of record, too. He was the production company of record in Georgia. So that meant his company is the one who applied for the film tax rebate. So. When it came to, and the way it works there, it's similar here. When you file your tax return, we file the, the paperwork that goes with that tax generate, that tax credit that was generated by the production company. So it's his tax return generating that tax credit. And so that tax credit is sitting there in his name, even though he has a contract that says he's sharing it, um, that says when that tax credit is generated, we're going to sell it. And then the uh, proceeds are distributed as follows. So it was very easy to make sure that Tom got paid first because it was in Tom's name. It was in Tom's name. Um, uh, and you know, ultimately, when you come to an agreement with somebody at the beginning and everybody understands the deal, even if there's some animosity at the end, everybody remembers what, what the deal was if it's written down and you sign it. Sometimes when you shake hands, the deal becomes nebulous at the end and people forget the details. So. Um, so uh, you know, Tom, Tom got paid, uh, and they felt really good about that. Um, in your situations, um, and, and let's just, just sort of open it up a little bit. I mean, the potential for co-production from where you sit, um, what, what do you think the barriers are that are stopping you from getting to the point where you can make a pitch similar to what Tom did? and bring people in from, from overseas. I have a couple of ideas, but I'm curious to know what you think the barriers might be there for you. I think knowledge. I mean, which is why we're here. Yeah. You know, to, yeah, I think knowledge and experience, because I don't know if a lot of us have, have done co-productions with people, um, whether they're on films. I mean, we've had, we've worked with like foreign crews coming in for commercials, mm -hmm. and uh, I think they were union, um, I think they were union crews, but as far as like doing a um, co crews I think it's just a lack of experience. That would make someone like me feel, okay, well, I feel secure about this knowledge base that I have. Right. Is it knowledge of, of just the way that the deal would work, or is it knowledge of your local landscape and, and, and all? I think first on, on how the deal would work. Yeah. Yes. Um, because any knowledge that I lack in our local landscape, I can learn. Yeah. As I'm here. So okay. I think in so far as like how the deal would work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Cool. Well, we do animation, so co-production is very attractive to producers. We don't have some of the obstacles in live action. We have primarily location, uh, you know, animation industry globally. is sort of built on co-productions. Yep. You don't have to, you know, and the benefit is really, you're right, profitability. Not that we bet on meters or, you know. The fact is, they put together a pie, and you know, if we could get 40% of the budget um, back through the state, then that's attractive um, to them. Um, on the flip side, however, the concerns come up with respect to uh, administration mm -hmm. of the incentives um, and the assurances that go with that. Um, the biggest one being the, as you said, the rebates come after, but the ability to finance the uh, expected money to be rebated. Um, that becomes biggest concern. But for us, co-production is the first, you know, protocol. Uh, we have very good um, incentives um, that allow it. The obstacle as well for us is, um, like everybody has good um, incentives in other animating, animation production territories. Mm -hmm. And there also are people like you guys who specialize in accounting and administering for it. I mean, like you just had a discussion with them. We have two attorneys trying to learn, and we have a, a couple accounting companies um, that have experience in uh, doing the accounting for the submission locally. But then it becomes complex when you're coordinating your incentive with an incentive in another territory. And we don't have that kind of uh, experience. Yeah, that that is difficult. So, um, so let's let's transition. Did, did anybody have anything else that was like a big barrier? You think um, <coughs> cashing out the rebates for the international co-producers can be can be problematic. Okay, tell me more. Um, right now in China, there's a there's a bit of a, a foreign exchange cash crunch, mm -hmm. and no producer wants TT dollars. Right. So that can be a little bit problematic in terms of in terms of yeah, getting yeah, it out. Yeah, you want Mm. And the, the, the way the incentive is here, it's um, so it's in U.S. dollar, so it would be it would it would it would it would hinge on it's in TT dollars, right? It's in TT dollars, but the thresholds in U.S. dollars. In U.S. in the documents that we we propose abroad, but it is actually paid in TT dollars because, as I was sharing earlier, the international production company has to partner with a local production company in order to access. That's right. So it's yeah. all processed through the local production right. company and it's paid in TT dollars. And the question about the currency um, and what currency it can be paid in going forward is a question that we are facing more and more. Yeah. It discounts it. Mm -hmm. The discussions, uh, for example, in the context of that, we, the only discussions that we could have with respect to our incentive with co productions must be those where we have to flow the incentives ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because you know, in terms of the bridge financing? Of course, because they're not interested, yeah, they're not interested in, uh, sometimes interested in funding it, but they're not interested in the TT dollars. But the whole point of the incentive is to spend yeah. and earn TT dollars. Yeah. So that becomes, uh, you know, so they, you know, on one side, so for example, they will front US or Canadian currency to the net amount. Right. You understand? So let's say the $100 local spend, mm -hmm. um, the co-producers will to say, okay, we will front you, uh, you know, 50%, yeah. um, but you have to flow the other 50% yeah. and deal with the risk of, well, be fixed up, deal with the risk right. of your own right. Spread you know. the risk, yeah. 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 I had a question, sorry, somebody didn't understand. When you say tax credit, because uh, we have a rebate, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you mean that, that do you mean that there's a specific amount, let's say $100, that will be a deduction on the absolute amount of taxes? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean that the, in that accounting year, whatever it may be, that the taxable income will reduce? Like, I don't understand specifically, and sure. I really, when, you know, this year, tax credit. North Americans talking about tax credit. Is that a credit on the tax owing, 
Or is that a reduction on the taxable amount? It's what's owed. It's your tax. Well, it's your tax, tax, your tax liability. So if, say you had no withholdings or no payments or anything in made during the year and you've done your tax return and you have a $25,000 tax liability, that tax credit would offset that tax $25,000. If I had a, John has the $50,000 tax credit, he offsets twenty-five thousand because that's all he owed during the year, or what his tax liability was. And in, in Atlanta, the other twenty-five that he hasn't used, it rolls forward. A rebate's different because you're just going to get a check. You're going to—it's called a cash rebate. Um, with the tax credit, there's never a check presented to you. It just—it's not a refund. It just keeps rolling forward. But that's why. That's right. We transfer it, and then we turn it into cash. That's where the, it becomes liquid. Right. So one of, one of the things is that in Trinidad, we have, we have a rebate and we have a credit. We have a, a deduction, and that one's a 150% a on whatever um, is, is sponsored. The thing is we also don't have a marketplace for the buying and selling of the credits mm -hmm. between the corporations. Um, it also makes it, it, it's also additionally difficult because you don't, uh, an international corporation can't come in and take advantage of that because it is only for, for TT corporations. Right. So there's a layer that's that's missing in between in, in the financial marketplace right. to, to both a float the money that he needs for his part of the rebate as well as to finance um, the, the full 150% because if that was available then a lot of local, local productions could be made at, at price points that would make them um, that would allow their quality to be internationally competitive. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the that's the hard and fast what's missing. Yeah. That, that, that's not a tax credit. Is that a tax credit too? The one fifty. Yeah. Yeah. The one fifty. It's a tax it's a, allowance. Yeah. Um, that's that's what. Don't, as, you have to as sign up on the register. We don't have a system of credits and transferring credits in this country. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not non-transferable. Is it, yeah, it's a straight deduction yeah. uh, that could go to either the production company or a sponsor. They were very specific right. sponsor, sponsor, not yeah. investor. investor. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand. The production yeah, uh, you know, the, the only the only thing I would say to that is, um, you know, the the incentive environment in Georgia. There are, and actually there's an incentive environment in New, New Jersey that's very similar where um, it's transferable with restrictions, uh, but it didn't work quite right. One great example we have uh, in the States is a, a music tax credit in Georgia that is very much the same way, where it's hard to meet thresholds. Um, and you, once you, you know, if you can't meet the thresholds, then you don't actually generate anything to sell, and so it becomes worthless. It's almost like, all or nothing, and so it can't be a part of that ROI. The only thing I would say to that is, do, do you guys have organizations that you're members of that allows you to communicate as a group with Film TT and with the local government where it isn't necessarily a union, it's just a... a, a group, industry a, a organization. Group, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I've opened a can of worms with that question, but uh, if it, <laughs> but uh, you know, we one of the one of the things that that Georgia did very successfully was to create the Georgia Production Partnership, which sounds like it's very closely aligned to what you're trying to do. It was very focused, and it has a very focused mission still of. Uh, helping to lobby for developing improvements to the tax credit and maintaining the tax credit. They didn't get outside of that, it stayed focused, and it addressed these issues and it allowed for the conversation to happen on an ongoing basis so that those improve. so what was really going on on the ground, what made it difficult for folks early on in that tax credit program to, to even use the credit, it was being addressed at the legislative level and changes were being made annually to make those incremental improvements. And so, um, you know, I, I think maybe, maybe the only takeaway that we could give you there that might help is if you guys, you know, in this organization, if you wanted 
to make contact, you know, take it back with you. If you want to make contact with that group and maybe find some lessons from them, run some questions past them on how they accomplish some of those, we'd be happy to make some connections on that. Um, the, the only reason I bring that up is you have to deal with what you have. And, and as you're trying to, um, uh, as you're trying to build out your co-production model, you can only really sell what you have to sell, um, which is the advantages of the film credit, the way that or the film instead of the way that they work now, and then your own, you know, talent and skill, um, and, and that's all you really have. And I feel with the rebate program and your talent and skill, you have enough to do that. Um, it's really about how you market it. Um, we had a couple of the things we wanted to get to. We've, We've got, got 15 minutes 15 left. 15 minutes left in this. The, the accounting piece, though, specific. The Shaking. accounting accounting for the tax credit we've pretty much yeah exactly yeah so one of the one of the big issues that that we heard mentioned over and over again was um, problems with reporting the tax credit um, and as a as a co-producer one of the values that you can provide to people coming from out of state is to understand the incentive program and to help them through it from documentation standpoint and understanding how to make the payment easy Right? So uh, there are credit environments and all over the world where payment can be very, very, very difficult. Uh, New York, for example, is a incredibly difficult credit environment. And it is a, it's a, it's, it's sort of, it's a rebate, it's a tax credit, but it's a refundable tax credit, mm -hmm. which makes it look like a rebate program. You mm -hmm. finish all your documentation, you turn it in, and the state government sends you a check. It's capped um, every year. like. 420, mm -hmm. 420 million cap every year, 30% tax rebate. Mm -hmm. And as a part of the requirements for that, you have stringent documentation standards. Um, and meeting those stringent documentation standards is so difficult that it takes, takes firms from out of state five to six months to even gather all those documents. <laughs> and if they go in unprepared, because they don't have someone yeah. in New York that can help them, You're screwed. then it could take even longer. So some of the horror stories we hear about that place is it takes way too long to get the money. 11 out. to 18 months. Jesus. It takes yeah. Long. And it, if you're in an indie environment, you, need you your can't money. wait that long for right. money to get your money from the government. That was yeah. like an example of New York. It, it, it is a tax credit, uh, but, but it's a refundable tax credit. So it works a lot like here where you have to register with the state. You don't have to actually be you know, a company that is a New York company necessarily, mm -hmm. but you have to register with the state so that you file a tax return with the state and then you get a refund, a, you get a, re, a refundable tax credit, which means that you didn't have to pay tax to get it back. They're just gonna send you a check mm -hmm. of the amount that you earned. So it, it looks a lot like it's a, a little, rebate environment. And it's now. bottleneck there and they have great procedures and the people at the Department of Revenue are great to deal with. We were on the phone with them today and like we hang up and they're, they're great. You know, they got it together but there's just a high volume. So walking in there and turning in your paperwork and your checklist and your qualified expenditures. If, yeah, if you're, if you're sloppy with that, you're only going to delay the process even further. So you have to make sure that you have good accounting procedures set up. Understand the tax film incentive that you're working with be able to break down why you know which expenditures or local labor have the support behind that be prepared to show your support by the time it gets to the next audit um, the, the second leg of it but that's the ministry that does it um, you know be prepared to have you know answer those questions don't don't say okay let me get back to you and I'll go dig and I'll find that have that ready when you have it in your books every qualified expenditure be prepared to pull pull the support for that make it easy on the front end whether it's your other tabs of your Excel document um, put an extra you know do do a few other extra pieces to make the process smoother because you want to get your cash back that's here that's in any that's in any uh, with any film incentive program you know and a good account it will help you with that too you may not have it though just to, since you're getting into um talking sort of comparatively with other uh, incentive programs. I'm just wondering how many people in the room are familiar at least with the basics of um, Trinidad Tobago's rebate program. At least understand the basics. Yeah? Yeah, so, so it's a rebate. Yeah, okay. so if, if mm -hmm. I could just add, just for the sake of comparison, because I think if you're getting into, okay, how, what do we have versus what everybody else has, and how can it work together, it may be useful to just say the basics of kind of what always, mm -hmm. always works. Yeah. So, um, 
And we can provide this information. We've just it's updated in, our review too. guide. So there's basics in that on it, but we've just updated the guide that kind of gives you the details of how it works, what you have to have, and so on. But in broad strokes, if you're a local producer making a local film, um, it's 35% cash back on your production expenditure, plus 20% for hiring local labor. The minimum spend is 100,000 TT dollars. The maximum spend is 52 million TT dollars. So that's kind of where you, where you sit. If it's an international production, they, again, they have to work with a local producer in order to access the rebate. And it is um, a tiered system of 12.5% to 35% if they spend between um, 100,000 US mm -hmm. to 499,999 US. And then above that, sorry, 900 to nine. And then above that from the 1 million to eight, that's when they start to be able to access the 35%. Um, and then on top of that, they get the 20% um, for, for hiring local labor. But ultimately, as we were saying before, they have to work through a local producer. So either way, there's an intent and, a, and an interest in making sure that local labor is hired, that blended crews are used, and it's not just for basic positions, as um, I know a lot of you have been able to experience working on productions in significant roles. Um, and, and the process in basically is that in the beginning of the process, once you indicate that you're ready to shoot a film, sort of six months from principal photography, we give you a checklist and a form to fill out to get a provisional certificate. Once you have the provisional certificate, you can then essentially use that certificate to leverage raising more funds for your film. You shoot your production within six months um, of getting the certificate. If you need to extend, you can come back to us to extend for up to two years. You, you do your principal photography, um, you get all your accounting mm -hmm. done, your auditing done and everything, mm -hmm. all of your finances, everybody gets paid. You then submit a final application uh, for the rebate up to three months after the film is premiered. So we mm -hmm. give you pretty much up to that time to be able to have everything in order. You then fill out the final form, um, the final application, and again, we walk you through the process with a checklist. Um, yeah. And then it comes to us in terms of now being administered internally. We then have to go through a process of checking the documents, and that's often where the back and forth comes in. Mm -hmm. um, if something is missing, if documents aren't correct, if it's the wrong form, etc. Um, we then have a process of going through with a rebate panel, which is made up of people from Ministry of Finance at senior levels, to then go through all of the documents and make sure everything is ordered. If there's any issues, we then have to go back to the auditor or to the producer again to ask for more information. Um, once the rebate panel is comfortable, it then has to go to the ministry. And this is where the double audit the second comes. audit. This is the second audit. The ministry, and this is something that was built into the process from the very beginning. The Ministry of Trade Auditor then reviews the application and makes sure it's in order. So they sign off, the rebate panel signs off. And that's when and that's no additional go. cost from the production no company this is absorbed exactly. by your government and exactly. we don't have this in the united states exactly. this is a second layer of protection exactly. um, and credibility to the film credit that you are you are getting and maybe sharing with an investor so it it it, it helps with the risk yeah. and once you have that double level of sign off that's when we issue the check and we work with the Ministry of Trade to prepare and issue the check. So that's how our review is. And, how, and the process takes how long about that for is, turnaround? It's been, um, in, uh, recently we've been able to turn it around, um, some, uh, a couple of them in about six months. But we have had sort of administrative issues, and I think that came up as mm -hmm. well, where the process has been much longer than we would have liked, and certainly people would have, would have appreciated. So we are in the process of re-engineering the rebate program to address the administrative gaps and to address the regulatory gaps as well. So the whole process, I mean, if everything works according to the way we wanted, I shouldn't say the number, but we can see how the program could actually be turned around within three months. Mm -hmm. Which is Once a lot less all than of the gaps 18 months or 11 yeah. months. <laughs> Um, is that for all productions or just films? Is that for films, TV series? Film. So within the rebate guide, which I will share with everyone as well, it has there's the um, the criteria for um, applying for um, uh, uh, for qualifying for the rebate, and it's feature length productions, it's television series, either 13 half hour or up to 13 episodes. Um, 
things like reality series don't qualify docu uh, documentary it does as well so what okay. is feature length content or television series content right. animated sure. length content as well we're looking also at um, seeing how we can increase um, the length of animation that's included for that um, but that's basically the criteria it's all listed in the rebate guide Okay. Will that be available on? It is on our website, website, but we, as part of the resources, we will share with you after the workshop. We will send that directly oh, to you because okay. it's an actually it's a, a document that's actually a PDF on our website. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks. And it's a really great document, by the way. We Thanks. we see we see dozens of them all the around flyer the flyer handout. It's a really really well done document. And I think I think the big lesson and we'll, we'll close with this on on the incentive piece is that um, you know and. Uh, this is something that's in your control as a co-producer. You being really knowledgeable about the credit and understanding how to make that credit flow more easily, being prepared with your expenditures, keeping really good records, and understanding what they need to see from you, and you taking, you know, making sure your side of the street is clean, will help you know, your relationship with the producers that are coming from out of you know, country to trust their relationship with you to get it done. Um, uh, you know, our reference to New York, sometimes it's out of your control, but there are things you can help New York to do to speed it up mm -hmm. um, if, if your records are very clean and available. And so as a co-producer, as you reach across the, uh, the water and try to get people onto the island to, to film, you know, that's one area where when you're building out your suite of what am I as a co-producer, um, that's, a, that's a big part of it. Um, and so hopefully you guys can, you know, if you want to investigate co-producing, it's a great way to leverage the credit. Mm -hmm. um, it, it'll also help you to generate some value over time. So maybe, you know, once you've made some fees, you can start to um, maybe self-fund some of your own mm -hmm. content and projects. Um, maybe develop relationships with these co-production folks who might help you to finance your projects. Because, you know, like we talked about yesterday, financing is about relationship. And there's, there's, a, there's no better way to convince somebody that you can get it done uh, than just getting one done, even if it's theirs. Then um, our next, the next panel at 3.30 is on return on investments. And so this is a really good segue. I think it was smart to put these two together. Accounting is very, um, is high level. And so this, you know, being understanding tax incentive rebates, uh, and other areas. This is like what John and I intended was for you guys to be able to use the tax incentive, which is great. You think 35% plus another 20%? That's really, that's way better than good. Like that's, we don't, we don't have anything like that in the States. But you can use this as your as your resource. And um, before we wrap, I want to I wanna plug stage 32. Um, thank them again for the opportunity to be here. And for you guys that aren't familiar with stage 32, do make yourself familiar and go to stage32.com. Um, wonderful group of educators there. John and I did a series this summer in June and July, a two-part series on accounting and the life cycle of a project from the very beginning to setting it up, entity structure, development, investors, conversations, all the way to post, wrap, tax credit incentives, final tax returns um, so check those out as well and there's a lot of stuff in between if you don't get exactly what you're looking for there the people at, at stage 32 and they're active here in Trinidad um, I'm sure they have something for you and some great forums on there you, you can talk to the people have been members for years and Christy I'll share as well that um, they're actually going to make up to four webinars available to everyone who's participated in the course for free so it's a definitely incentive nice. to sign up and be a member of Stage nice. It's an incentive to explore all of the training that they do have on there. They're very keen to work with more people in the Caribbean, and this workshop is a way to sort of start that that uh, kind of opening mm -hmm. doors. Above the line, below the line webinars, yeah. legal accounting, yeah. Any final questions before we break? I just have one question. Yeah. I don't know if in the next session of this, but like grants and um, like checks, the rebate checks, in accounting, like what is that? Is that income, like how do you, what, do you, what is that? Yeah. Is that check, is that like income? Yes. Taxable? Yeah. yeah. It's taxable income? Yeah. I mean, so you have to pay tax taxable taxable income, income, but you're going to have expenses to offset that to bring it down, you would expect. But ideally, but, I mean, but in the broad context, I do have to pay tax on your rebate. Yeah, there, I, I don't know of any jurisdictions where that's a non-taxable income. And the grants are, yeah. are accounted for a little differently, but ultimately, 
grants are accounted for the same, but there are some other special, it just depends on the locality. I know there are some grants in certain uh, cities in the states where it's not taxable up to a certain threshold. Right, and then after that threshold, or you could. There are certain tax laws that say that you don't have to recognize the income all in the first. You can spread it out over three years, four years. Certain elections that you can make and defer to defer the income later. Um, grants are a little different. But if you think about a grant, I mean, if you have a one hundred thousand dollar film and you get a twenty thousand dollar grant to make that film. Um, you're spending all of that. So from an income tax perspective, you're generating, you know, basically as much expense as you have income on the grant and then the financing you have coming from other places. Generally, you're, you know, on a project where you're developing your own intellectual property and selling it, you're really not getting income that's going to be taxable until after you've created it, spent all the money, and generate revenue from the product. So it isn't like that grant money generally is taxable as soon as you get it. You're going to get that money. You're going to spend it. You're offsetting it with expenses. So from an income tax perspective, it works a little bit differently. If you were in a VAT country, we had a value add tax throughout the process. You might have some tax hits from, from other places. So that, that could happen. But generally, even in a VAT area, that sort of income is not a VAT you know, item. So I don't know exactly about right. here. Do you, want to, do you want to add yeah. something? I wanted to add that in regards to our rebate, when we're looking at the qualifying expenditure, any grants received from governmental organizations will not be counted um, in your qualifying expenditure. It will be deducted from, from that. It's not a qualified expenditure that would apply towards the 35% yeah. the or the 20%. Yeah. Right, because then you'd be double dipping. Exactly. You'd be double right. dipping. But if it's yeah. a private grant, then that doesn't That's matter. different. Yeah. Yeah. From the government. From the government. Yeah. Because you're already getting government money. Yeah, a double dip. You have no double dipping. Because I spend money from the grant, what I use. Yeah, no. It doesn't count. It's a one-year income. Yeah, we're doing it. We're doing it. Anything that I spend, you spend it as an investment. That has to be for your budget. Yeah, okay. Okay. So it doesn't count in terms of what the grant is. The final qualifying expenditure. Okay. That rebate will be based on. Right. So you calculated for. Sure. Okay. Right. I hope I see you guys at the next, at the 3.30. And then, uh, if not, we'll be available again on Sunday. We'll be doing participating in the roundtables. Yeah. So just to say to the group, um, we are doing these roundtables on Sunday that will allow you sort of smaller, um, ten-minute kind of speed dating almost um, <laughs> sessions with the with the educators. So we love if you could join us on Sunday. It's from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, I sent an email this morning indicating what the new schedule is for that, so it's a bit tighter. And then we're also hosting a mixer in the evening, so we want to continue the networking. So we hope you can join us at 7 o'clock at the Normandy, 7 to 9 on Sunday evening. So 11 to 1 here. Yeah. 11 to 1 here for the round tables, and then 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Normandy for the mixer. Yeah. It'll be fun. Party time. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys. Bye -bye.